Thank you, Janie, Matthew. We appreciate that. Good morning to you. I hope you're doing well. You know a scripture verse, and I bet it's one of those for some of you. You know what it says, but you might not know where it's from. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me do what? Bless his holy name. name. That's exactly right. I'm going to get these guys started. Two, three, and... But the next verse says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. God is good. Amen. He is so good to us. And I'm afraid sometimes we fail to acknowledge his goodness. But we want to do that this morning. Just through a simple little chorus, we want you to listen to it one time. You may know it. But if you don't, we want you to learn it real quickly and sing it with us the second time, all right? We'll get you started. It goes a little like this. We will remember, we will remember, we will remember the works of your hands. We will stop and give you praise for great is thy faith. Did you know it now? Sing it with us. We will remember. We will remember. We will remember the works of your hands. We will stop and give you praise for great is thy faithfulness. You're our creator. Sustainer, deliverer, our comfort and joy. Throughout the ages, you've been our shelter, our peace in the midst of the storm. With signs and wonders, you show your power. With precious blood. You showed us your grace. You've been our helper, our liberator, the giver of life with your wings. Here's the part you know. We will remember. We will remember. We will remember the works of your hands. We will stop. Make it personal. Make it personal. Here we go. Right on the lyric. You ready? I still remember the day you saved me. The day I heard him call out my name. You remember that? He said he loved me. Thank you. 
thank the Lord this morning for his goodness, his faithfulness, new morning by morning. Let's sing it together. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh Joe for leading us this morning, but particularly as we uh, begin with remember what the Lord has done. Over in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, it talks about to proclaim the wondrous works of God. To proclaim them, we remember them and God's faithfulness. Would you bow your heads and just uh, take a moment this morning as uh, we pray. Each of us goes to the Lord in prayer, but would you just take a moment to Think about the wondrous works of God in your life over the past week or two or last few weeks, what God has done and how he has shown himself to you.
your own way. Just praise him now. Our Father, we thank you for the incredible privilege that each one of us as your children, Lord, each of us has the privilege to come before you, to fellowship with you, to love you, to thank you, to praise you. And this morning, Father, we have lifted up our praises to you for the wondrous works that you've done in our individual lives. Lord, I know each of us can look back and see how you have just shown yourself in so many ways and realize that it is you and you alone. Lord, as a congregation, we thank you how you have blessed us. You're good to us. And Lord, we pause and just give you praise and glory and honor for what you've done, but even more for who you are. Lord, we thank you for this past week that through our food ministry, we were able to feed over 800 people and provide food this past week. We thank you for that provision. We thank you for this new ministry. Lord, we thank you that uh, a week ago, uh, Lord, you took care of over 250 kids at camp and we saw kids come to know Jesus Christ and many of them have grown in their faith and Lord, they're gonna make a difference in their school this year because of that week of the investment of so many leaders and so many that gave so that these children could go. Father, we thank you for our mission teams in Alaska and the work that they're doing there. And First Baptist Anchorage will be a stronger church and a brighter lighthouse for you because of the investment of 70 different people that have gone this year to Anchorage to make a difference there. Lord, we thank you for our work in New York City and in Westmoreland and Madison. And we pray for them today. Lord, that each of them will experience your presence in a real and strong way. Lord, this morning, speak through our pastor, accept our worship that comes full of thanksgiving and praise. And it's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to continue on with our music, but we'll say a word of welcome to those of you that are guests. If this is your first time with us, we thank you for being here today. At the end of the service, uh, Pastor Chester and I are going to be out in the foyer. Please come by. Uh, we want to meet you. Thank you for being here today and just get to know you. Joe, thank you for being here and leaving us this morning. Thank you, Bruce. Go ahead and stand and let's continue our time of worship. It's so good to hear you sing praises to God this morning. Lift up your voice.
Thank you so much, Rachel Choir Orchestra. Joe, thank you so much. Good to have you and Marty here in Hendersonville, and thank you for leading us in worship today. Well, I'm glad to see you. I had some notes from several folks today saying they'd had sickness in their family. They'd be watching online today, so we welcome all of you that are tuned in that way. It's not the same as being here in person. I think you would agree with that. It's just not the same as being in person, but it's better than nothing. And it's nice to have it when, um, when you do have to be away or not feeling well. So uh, we welcome those of you that are tuning in. Well, take your Bible and find Luke chapter 1. And for those of you that might possibly be visiting with us and you wonder why is he reading from a Christmas passage in July. The reason is because we started a study in the Gospel of Luke just a few weeks ago, and we are still very early in it. We're in the first chapter still. We're going to have Christmas in August this year. I guess that's okay since the Hallmark Channel just went for a month long with those dastardly movies that Bruce Raley loves. If you ever want to get... If you want to get Bruce a present, get him a series of all Hallmark movies, and he will love you forever. He just, he loves Hallmark movies. There's something, and I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Don't waste your money on a Hallmark movie for him. Well, we're in the first chapter today, and it's a really, uh, it, it, it's a really interesting passage. I want you to have your Bible open. It's, it's one thing to look at it on the screen, listen to me read it. It's something else to hold God's Word in your hand and to see it yourself. So I hope you have a copy of God's Word. Now, let me remind you that Luke is unusual in all the writers of the New Testament. As far as we know, as far as it's clearly stated, Luke is the only Gentile writer of the New Testament. Now, what that means is that he looks at life through a different lens. He just sees the world differently because he is not Jewish by background. He is Gentile, and he, he sees things from a different perspective. Just for example, one of the ritual prayers that every Jewish man prayed every morning was this prayer. God, I thank you that I am not a Gentile, a woman, or a dog. Now that was their view of life. I thank you, God, that I am not a Gentile, a woman, or a dog. Now, because of Luke's writing and because of his particular perspective, we see this from a vantage point and a viewpoint that we otherwise might not see. Luke tells us, not just in this passage, but throughout his gospel, Luke tells us more about the involvement and the place of women in the life and ministry of Jesus than anyone else. That makes sense. He wasn't looking at life through those Jewish lens. He was seeing it differently. And so because of his perspective and because of who he was, he makes some things open to us. He makes us aware of some things that we might not otherwise see. And he was a physician. And because of that unique perspective as a physician, he was interested in some things that maybe some other writers wouldn't have paid much attention to. He focuses a great deal on the births of these two babies that we're talking about with John the Baptist and Jesus. He focuses on the pregnancies of these women. Why? Well, he's a physician. He thinks differently because he's a physician. He's looking at this from a different perspective. And as a result of that, he just gives us a, a, a vantage point, a viewpoint, if you will, that we might not have gotten otherwise. So it's a very interesting passage, and it's an interesting way to look at the passage. We're going to start reading today in verse 39, so I hope you have a Bible there with you, and we'll read down to verse uh, 56. Now, as I start this, let me remind you of something that you know, but I want this to be clear in your mind. I think there are a lot of people that they kind of have this image in their mind of these two young women, and they're both expecting babies, and so they're both going, they happen to be cousins, they're relatives. They're going through the same journey, so they're dealing with the same emotions of, of being pregnant and, and, and expecting a child and all of the pressures of that and, and probably about the same age. Well, they're not the same age at all. This is not two young girlfriends who both happen to be expecting babies. One of these is a very seasoned woman that is most likely in her 60s. Elizabeth is most likely in her 60s. Mary is a young teenager. This is not two girlfriends who are just getting together and, 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 and sharing what they're going through in life. This is more like a grandmother and a granddaughter. 
This is one who's, who's receiving encouragement and insight from a much older woman, and yet they both have something to offer each other. So let's read it beginning in verse 39. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greetings, the baby leaped inside of her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, You are the most blessed of women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped inside of me. She who has believed is blessed because what was spoken to her by the Lord will be fulfilled. And Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his slave. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, because the mighty one has done great things for me, and his name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of, their, of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, mindful of his mercy, just as he spoke to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months. Then she returned to her home. Interesting, isn't it? Now, there are two women in the play here, in the drama that's unfolding. It, it, they've been thrown together. Now, they, they, they're relatives. They, the scripture's clear about that. But th they've been thrown together in this divine drama to save mankind. And, and now they're walking through something in God's plan that has thrown them together, and they are finding this encouragement with each other. Now, the two women both have a prominent role in what I just read. First of all, the first part of the passage really deals with Elizabeth. Uh, if you start in verse 39, go down to verse 45, let's focus on Elizabeth a little bit. She's at home. She's now been there for six months. It's been very quiet because Zechariah was struck dumb. He has not been able to talk because he did not believe. When Gabriel came and told him that he was going to have a baby, Gabriel did not believe, uh, excuse me, uh, Zechariah did not believe, and as a result of that, he hasn't been able to talk. She's six months into her pregnancy when Mary comes to visit her. Now, notice the way it starts there. Verse 39 says, In those days Mary set out and hurried to the hill country of Judah. Doesn't seem like a big deal to us. Wouldn't be a big deal today. As a matter of fact, she lived in Nazareth in Galilee. If uh, you jumped in a car today in Galilee and you drove down to Judah, we don't know exactly where this would have been, but if you had gone to the hill country of Judah and found a home that might have been Zechariah and Elizabeth, you could do that in a couple of hours. It was a very simple thing, but in those days, not so simple. It wasn't a couple of hours in a car. It was several days maybe two or three days, and so she makes this journey, and she goes to the home of Zechariah and Elizabeth, and look at what Scripture says happens. When she went into the house and she greeted Elizabeth, the Bible says that the baby inside of Elizabeth leaped within her. Now, that is quite a blow to abortionist. To those who say that an unborn baby is not a living thing, to those who say that an unborn baby would not know any of these kinds of things, here is a picture of the very first person, the very first human being to recognize the coming of the Lord Jesus. It wasn't Elizabeth first. It was the baby inside of Elizabeth. The Bible says that in the moment that Mary spoke to her cousin Elizabeth, that the baby inside of her began to leap. Now that is a... That is a word of, of the, the validity of a life within a human being. That baby jumped inside of his mother. You say, well, why did that happen? Well, let me show you why that happened. Go back to verse 15. 
chapter 1, verse 15, in the prophecy that Gabriel gave to Zechariah, this is part of what it said. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. And when John the Baptist, three months prior to his birth, six months after his conception, when John the Baptist inside of his mother heard Mary's voice, John the Baptist recognized that the unborn baby inside of Mary would be the Savior of the world, and he began to leap inside of her. Now, Elizabeth makes sure that we understand that. She gives us an explanation in verse 44. For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped inside of me. Then Elizabeth gives a, 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 a kind of a beatitude, if you will. She uses the word blessed three times there. You remember the the blessings that Jesus gave, the, the, the beatitudes in Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, they will uh, inherit the kingdom of God, um, blessed are the meek, uh, all of those different blessings that God gave and uh, that Jesus gave in the beatitudes, well here is a word of blessing that Elizabeth speaks, you are the most blessed of women, your child will be blessed, and then look at what she says in verse 43, how is it, she says, how could it happen to me that the mother of my Lord, in that moment, in that very moment, Elizabeth realizes and recognizes that the baby, as her baby recognized, she now recognizes the baby inside of Mary is the Lord Jesus. So the first part of the passage is really just the, the conversation that's taking place between Mary and Elizabeth and as these babies are introduced to each other. But then let's turn our thought to the more important part of the passage. Let's look at the song that Mary sings. Now this passage talks about Mary believing and about her faith. I want you to hear something today and I want you to hear this clearly. I'll probably say this several times today, but I want you to hear this. Faith is not just uh, accepting a, a, a set of principles or a proposition. Faith is not saying, well, I believe this or I believe this or I believe this. Faith results in the way we live our life. And the reason that the Bible says that Mary was a woman of faith is because she believed what the angel said when Gabriel came and spoke to her. We studied that last week. But she not only believed that, she trusted that God was going to do what God said he was going to do, and she submitted her life to his hands. She put, that's what she meant when she said, I am your slave. So real biblical faith is not just saying, oh, I believe this or I believe that or I believe in this or I believe in that. Real biblical faith is believing to a point that you trust and you submit your life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so she gives us the most incredible statement here that sometimes we call Mary's song. If you have a heading in your scripture, it may say Mary's song or Mary's praise. Some call this the Magnificat. How many of you have heard this passage called the Magnificat? Where does that come from? Well, it, it comes from the first statement that says, My soul, this translation says, proclaims the Lord's greatness. Many translations say, My soul magnifies, and it is that word magnify that really is, is the beginning of the word Magnificat. So this is a song that Mary sings. Now, she might not have really actually broken out into a song itself. She might have just said this. It may be more of a poem that we would think of, but it is something that over time it came to be understood to be a song, and through history it has been put to music. Now, Zechariah is going to add another verse to it shortly. And after that, the angel that comes to the shepherds in the fields of Bethlehem, they're going to add another verse to it. And when we get to Luke chapter 2, Simeon's going to add another verse to it. And this song is just going to grow and grow and grow as we move through this story. But this is where it begins as Mary sings this incredible, incredible song. Let's look at what she says. And Mary said... My soul proclaims the Lord's greatness, the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Let me tell you a couple of things about that. Number one is the word greatness. Now, if you were here last week, I pointed out 
that the word greatness is the word mega. It's the same word again there. He is, she is talking about the mega, the greatness of God. Our God is mega. Our God is great. I said last week, if you took all the great men and women that have ever lived and you rolled them up and put them into one human personality, that person would not care, compare to the greatness of our God. Our God is mega. Our God is greater. He is greater than all others. He is greater than any who has ever been born. She is talking about the greatness, the mega-ness of our God. But look at what she says there in verse 47. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. Do you remember me talking uh, either last week or the week before? I don't remember exactly which one, but talking about the view that some people have about Mary, that she lived a sinless life. You remember that, that discussion that they believe that she was born of a, an immaculate conception, that she was not born in the natural way, that she lived a perfect life and a sinless life and that, that she actually is a co-redeemer with Jesus and that there are people that believe that. Well, look at what this verse says. Verse 47, she says, he is my Savior. Now listen, a person doesn't need a Savior unless they're a sinner. A person doesn't need a Savior unless they're lost. A person doesn't need to be forgiven unless there is sin in their life. She acknowledged in this Magnificat, she acknowledged in this song that she is singing that she needs a Savior and that this one that God is sending has been sent to take away not only the sin of the world, but he has been sent to take away her sin. She makes no claim whatsoever. As a matter of fact, just the opposite. She says, he is my Savior. Look at the next thing she says in verse 48. Because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his slave. There is a spirit of humility that comes out of this woman. Now let me tell you something really amazing out of these words that we're reading right now. Uh, keep in mind that these came from about a 14-year-old young woman. And yet what you have here in these verses of this poem, this song, this Magnificat, whatever you refer to it as, these verses that I'm dealing with right now, what you have contains some of the most profound, the deepest theology that you'll find anywhere. This is just incredible. As a matter of fact, you can go to a seminary today and you can sign up to take a course that will spend an entire semester doing nothing but talking about this particular passage. Now, how did a 14-year-old girl, how did a young woman like this have such a profound and a deep theology that allowed her to say the things that she's saying? I would say two things. First of all, she was a student of God's Word. She knew God's Word. She is quoting Old Testament. She is quoting what they had. They didn't have the New Testament as we do. She is quoting what they had as Scripture. She knew God's Word. But the second thing is she was filled with the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit was upon her. She had submitted herself to Him. She had not just put her faith in Him to say, I believe this and this and this. I said this a minute ago. She has trusted in him. She has submitted her life to him. She has said, I am your slave. Whatever you want to do with me, that's what I want you to do. And the result of all of that is that God has given her this incredible word. There's a humility there, the humble condition of his slave. Look at verse 49. Sure, middle of verse 48 says, Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed because the mighty one, the mighty one has done great things for me. That word in the early language, in the old language, that word, we now, we refer to that as omnipotent. He is omnipotent. You know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of statements about who God is that describe him as all. He is all present. He can be everywhere. God's not limited to one place. If God's here with us, that doesn't mean he can't be across the street with the church over there, the church down the street, or with these people who are watching at home. Oh, no, God can be everywhere because he is omnipresent. He is all present. He is all knowing, omniscient. God knows all things. You see, you can't keep secrets from God. 
you can't keep God out of the loop. Anybody ever kept you out of the loop? You know, you're, you're not on the need to know uh, 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 list, and so there's something that some people know that you don't know. You can't put God on the no need to know list. You can't keep anything from God because God is omniscient. But one of the things the Bible teaches about God is that he is omnipotent. Omnipotent. He is all-powerful. God can do what God chooses to do. Sometimes we try to put God in a box, and, and, and we think we've got God figured out, and God can't do this, God can't do that. Listen, God's God. God is God. God can do what God chooses to do. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, all-sufficient. And this 13, 14-year-old girl has an understanding about these theological truths that blows my mind, that scholars today wrestle with, and yet this young girl lets these thoughts just roll off her lips with this incredible beauty because the mighty one has done great things for me. Look at that next statement there right before the end of the 49th verse. And his name is, somebody say it, Holy. Thank you for singing that song, Joe. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. Holy means to be set apart. Holy means to be different. Holy doesn't mean holier than thou. Holy doesn't mean somehow that we pull our righteous robes up around ourselves and we don't let dirt and filth of this world get on us. Holiness describes being separate, different. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 only thou art holy. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. She says his name is holy. Verse 50, his mercy I haven't been telling you to underline these words. I've been going through them, though. Verse, verse 46, greatness. Verse 47, he's my Savior. Verse 48, the humble condition. Verse 49, the mighty one and holy. Now verse 50, mercy. His mercy is from generation to generation. God is merciful. Listen, never forget the difference between mercy and grace. Sometimes we use those like it means the same thing. It doesn't. See, God's grace is that he gives me something I don't deserve. I don't deserve his forgiveness, but he gives it to me. That's grace. I don't deserve a relationship with him, but he lets me have one. That's grace. I don't deserve that. I don't deserve it, and yet God's amazing grace is incredible and wonderful. And God pours something out on me that I don't deserve because he loves me and you. Mercy is the opposite. If grace is God giving me something that I don't deserve, mercy is God withholding something from me that I do deserve. I deserve punishment. I deserve hell. I deserve separation. I deserve to never have a relationship with God, but God's mercy withholds that from me. Merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity, she says his mercies from generation to generation on those who fear him. He's done a mighty deed. There's that same word again, that all-powerful word, omnipotent, omnipotent. He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He toppled the mighty from their thrones. He exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry. Verse 54, he has helped his servant. That means God is kind. Did you know that God is kind? I've learned something in my life. The more I focus on the kindness and the goodness of God, the more God's kindness and goodness comes out in my life. I think I've also found that the more I focus on the judgment of God, the more judgmental I tend to become. The more I focus on the kindness and the goodness of God, the more kind and good I am in my life. Verse 55, he says, Just as he spoke to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants 
forever. Well, you sang that song too, Joe. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There's no shadow of turning with thee. He is faithful. I don't want to end this, though. I don't want to end without you noticing verse 56. I think sometimes we read the Magnificat, we read that song, and we, we get to the great crescendo end of it, and, and verse 56 is just a tagline to end the, the paragraph, but it's not. It says, And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. Now, how many months pregnant was Elizabeth when she got there? Six. And she stayed three months. You know, some people think that the reason that Mary went there to start with is because her parents were embarrassed that she was pregnant and they sent her away. Well, that makes no sense. She was only there three months. A, a 13 or 14-year-old girl in the first three months of pregnancy, she's not even going to look pregnant. She didn't go home until it started. She was there for the first three months. She wasn't there because they were embarrassed. They sent her away. She was there because she was ministering to Elizabeth. Here's what I want you to see. When you've truly worshipped the Lord, what do you do when you've worshipped the Lord? I'm going to be honest and tell you that a lot of people, when they come to worship the Lord, what they do is nothing. Nothing. Some folks go to Cracker Barrel. That's what you do when you've worshipped the Lord. You go eat. You go take a nap. What do you do when you've really worshipped the Lord? Let me tell you what you do. When you've really been in the presence of the Lord, the result of that is that we minister in Jesus' name. Let me show you a passage over in Hebrews 13. You, you can leave Luke, and uh, I, I won't go back to it. Go to Hebrews 13. I want you to see this. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Here's what it says. This is at the very end of the book of Hebrews. Therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips that confess his name. That is, we worship him. But look at the next verse. Don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. When we have really worshipped the Lord, let me make this really personal to you today. If you have genuinely worshipped the Lord this morning, the result of that should be that this afternoon you're going to treat somebody with kindness. If you have worshipped the Lord this morning, the result is that you will be kind to someone as a result. She stayed three months as an act of kindness to help her cousin through that long three months of her pregnancy. And when the baby was born, she went home. Now, what's the so what of the passage? Here it is. When I talk about having faith, it's not believing a certain idea. It is that we trust God, we put our faith in God, and we submit our life to his plan. Lord, I am your slave. Use me. And when we've truly worshipped him, here's the second so what. The result is that we will be kind. We will be compassionate. We will be more Christ-like to someone after we've been in the presence of Jesus. Don't tell me that you've worshipped the Lord today and then go be ugly to somebody at the restaurant. If you've been in the presence of Jesus... It ought to make a difference in the way you deal with people this afternoon. We've worshipped him this morning. Now let's live it out the rest of the day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the passage and, and the practical nature of this, that our worship is wonderful to lift up your praises but it has to be carried out in the way we live with other people. So, Lord, as we leave here and we go home, walk through our neighborhood, go to a store, go to a restaurant, whatever we do today and the rest of this week, may the fact that we have been in the presence of Jesus affect the way we treat other people. What we say, how we act, what we do, May the kindness and compassion of Jesus be evident. I pray in his name. Amen. Let's stand together.
We'd love to have you make a commitment in your life to trust him, to obey him, to say, Lord, my life is in your hands. For some of you, that may mean joining this church. For somebody in this room, it means publicly professing that Jesus is the Lord of your life and that you're willing to say that. Whatever the Lord would speak to you, whatever commitment you need to make in your life, let's begin truly worshiping him, not just with our words, but with our lives. If the Lord leads you, Bruce and I are waiting. Joe, let's sing that song. Take up thy cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I gave my life to ransom thee. Surrender your all today. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. He drew me closer to his side. I sought his will to know. And in that will I now abide, wherever he leads I'll go, wherever he leads I'll go, wherever he leads I'll go, I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Thank you, Joe. If you have a spiritual decision, you know the Lord's calling you to make. A pastor and I will be out in the foyer. We would be honored to pray with you and visit with you about that decision. Uh, guest, please come by. Let us meet you. Say thank you for being here uh, today. Next week, uh, Jason Breland, our new worship pastor, will be here with his family. Uh, school starts back. Uh, some schools starting this week, some next week, some the next week. So we're kind of in that mode. But as we all get back together, we look forward to just an incredible fall and a beginning. One prayer request. Uh, on uh, Sunday, August the 21st, we're having a lake baptism service. We've done that the last few years, and God has just blessed incredible ways. If the Lord is leading you uh, to follow him in baptism, if you'll call me, call the church office, come by out in the foyer. Uh, we'd love to visit with you about that. Looking forward to a wonderful day uh, out at Rockland Park as uh, we have a lake baptism. Joe, let's close out. Amen. Well, we've come to worship, and I hope that you have worshiped, and I hope that we will leave to minister, to do what God's called us to do. That might mean leaving a bigger tip than normal at the restaurant. Y'all think about that. Y'all think about that. My, my pastor used to say, don't go in there and leave a dime. Don't just leave 10%. You tie the church, go in there and bless those people because they work hard. That was free. That didn't cost you anything. But as we go, we don't go in our own strength. We go in the strength and the victory of Jesus. Let's sing it. Oh, victory in Jesus. My Savior forever, he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. God bless you. Have a great day.